Wow, what a room. Um, hello, and uh, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Jen Hassam, and I am the executive director of the Broadbent Institute. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Toronto Public Library. Uh, here, where the library operates, there's been a human activity uh, for over 15,000 years. And so we really want to acknowledge that we're in the space of the Huron-Wendat, um, and um, the Seneca and Anishinaabe First Nations. So parents, aunties, uncles in the room, we also have a kid's space in the back. If you didn't notice it, it's kind of hidden back there. So feel free to bring your kiddos uh, to the back area. We have, uh, and I they're also over here sometimes. Um, so this is a kid-friendly space and uh, our lovely staff member, Kat Mockler, will be child-minding during the event. Um, I cannot believe the energy in this room. Thank you so much for making the choice to join us on a Sunday afternoon. Um, it, you know, given the significant challenges and multiple overlapping crises that we face today, it's really a testament that we can still bring people together with the hope of a social democratic message of equality, democracy, and sustainability. So uh, we're proud at the Broadband Institute, of course, to be hosting this book launch uh, in, in, as part of the Toronto, um, uh, sorry, this book launch here in Toronto as part of a national tour. And our next speaker, uh, who will deliver an official welcome, is someone who we know has a passion for democracy, art, community organizing, the public service, you may, you may start to guess who this might be. Uh, she served as a school board trustee, later as a member of parliament. Uh, she's the founder of the Institute for Change Leaders. Please let's all welcome Mayor Olivia Chow. Amazing energy is right. 1980, December 2nd. I was uh, almost a new Democrat. <laughs> I just accepted a job to work for Dan Heap, um, the member of parliament that had just got elected. And uh, and there was news that three nuns and, uh, and a person that support them in El Salvador was en route away from the El Salvador airport where they were kidnapped, raped, murdered, killed, dumped on the side of the road. They were Marinor sisters. And I remember it really well. Why? Because I went to Mary North Sister Schools when I was in Hong Kong. And Mary North Sisters taught me something about justice, social justice, and later on, liberation theology. And they were brutally murdered because of the work they did in El Salvador. And then in, later on, a few months later, in March of 1990, 1981, IWD, they, uh, there was rally about how could it be that the Canadian government continues to support the American policy of supporting the Deaf Squad and the Junta in El Salvador at the time. And I thought, wow, this is tough because the Americans were so all in supporting the, the uh, El Salvador uh, government. Why am I raising this? Because at that time, when I was just beginning to learn about politics, the leader of the New Democratic Party of Canada, Ed Broadband, said that, El S that Canada needs to have independent foreign policy from the United States. And that's what the Trudeau government must do. And the Trudeau government at that time, Trudeau had 
jeered at broadband peace mission to the country. And, uh, and, and Ed, what he did was said, one judges human beings and politicians not by what they say, but by what they do. You know, through these years, Ed, if I may call you Ed, Mr. Broadband, has always stood up for people that have very little power and have never been afraid to speak the truth. And uh, because of the New Democrats at the time, there was El Salvadorian refugees policy. People were able to come to Canada. There was a Chilean policy also. And some of you will know that policy well because some friends of mine here came in through those refugees policy. And then by 1983, uh, people from El Salvador could actually become permanent residents in Canada. Instead, of being deported back to the country. Because at the time, the uh, US were really deporting everybody back to El Salvador to their death. I raised that because it was the beginning of my political uh, education. And social democracy, for me at that time, I did not take politics in school. I have no idea, I don't understand any of it. But I knew there was this new Democratic Party leader at Broadband that stood up for human rights, stood up for equality, stood up for ending child poverty by year 2000. Remember that, prop, that, that motion through House of Commons? It was that motion in the House of Commons that gave me the energy and the passion to say, yeah, we need to create children nutrition programs. We need to have dental care for kids. We need to make sure no kids go to bed hungry. So there are generations and generations of new Democrats, of political um, elected people that follow the footstep and of Ed Broadband, the entire social democratic principle. And within a hundred days that I became the mayor, I remember this principle and I said, where can I find money to build affordable housing, to buy some housing and for, uh, to, to buy some buildings and turn it, private buildings, into public buildings so that the housing could be affordable forever for the tenants. Where could I find the money for rent supplement? Well, and I, what, I remember what Ed Broadband taught and said, okay, tax, okay, that's what government's about. So what I did was to say that if you're a speculator, if you're leaving your apartment buildings or homes empty, we're gonna tax you more. And if you are going to uh, buy homes that are very expensive, you can pay a little bit more in the land transfer tax and taking that money uh, to invest in affordable housing. So I'm living every day in what I do, the social democratic principle that I laid out by this wonderful person, Ed Broadband, uh, right here, yes. So it gives me great honor to welcome all of you here. As the mayor of Toronto, I welcome all of you. And I want you to know at the last council, we once again said that the federal government needs to have a national child food program. Yes, yeah, that's what we need to do. Ed Broadband's uh, motion in to, to say in 1989 that we need to end child poverty by, by, nine, uh, by 2000. We're not there quite yet. <laughs> We're gonna do better. So today, as we are intellectually nourished by the amazing panel, let us recommit ourselves to say that uh, the social democratic principle 
Let's put it in action. Let's make sure that we don't have everyone going to food banks and sleeping on the street and kids going to bed hungry. Let us live that principle and turn those principles in action. Thank you so much for being here this morning, this afternoon. Thank you so much, Mayor Chow, for getting us in the right headspace and, and a, giving a gracious introduction and welcoming. Um, and uh, my job is so easy uh, as MC because our next set of speakers also need very little introduction. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, to the stage so we can begin our program, Ed Broadbent. <laughs> Ed, come on. Yeah. I just want to introduce the other characters up here with me. Yes. Down the far end is Jonathan Sass. <laughs> Beside him is Francis Abel. Uh, just a short while ago, she was made a member of the Order of Canada. <laughs> and Luke Savage. Well, I have to thank my good friend, Olivia Chow, the mayor. Uh, that was a very warm introduction. I greatly appreciate it. First time I ever kissed a mayor, by the way. Uh, I, I should provide a, a warning. Because of my experience when people are speaking, the longer the pages of notes, the shorter the speech. And I happen to have a very short page, one page, so beware. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm delighted to be here on this occasion, and I, I want to thank a few people. I want to, of course, thank ECW, the publishers, the representatives are right here. I, I want to thank the Broadbent Institute for organizing this event, uh, the wonderful staff of this library for being our host. Um, and that's it for the thanks. <laughs> I, want, I want to say a bit about the origin of the book. As some of you who have, have got it already will have discovered, it's not a conventional biography at all. Uh, and I never intended in my long political life to have a, a conventional biography. Because I, of my experience, I found whatever the ideological persuasion of the politician, politicians who do autobiographical work end up writing about how they were right about everything and their opponents were wrong, and using, using the occasion of writing the book to prove it. Well, I, I think most of us, and of course there's notable exceptions to that, but that's a tendency. So I, if I ever did a, a book, I said to myself, I would like it to be a book about ideas in action uh, in the context of playing out in real history. And along came two remarkable people, Tony Jutt, some of you will know, is a very distinguished historian, now dead, unfortunately, for some time. But he had a friend, uh, fellow academic, uh, Tim Timothy Snyder of Princeton, and they got together and had a, a wonderful format, something we have duplicated. They had uh, uh, Mr. Snyder asking Tony certain questions, complicated questions, 
about history, about ideas, and that was the, the gist of the book. But it was extraordinarily stimulating to read a book where there's an exchange between two people well, equally well informed, equally committed. And a lot of, so that format came along to appeal to my co authors here a short time ago and to me. And so that, that's what we did. So this, this book consists of 10 chapters, uh, each with an introduction. An introduction is then followed up by a series of questions. Nor normally it would be one of the co-authors off to my left asking a question. Sometimes there'd be more asking questions. And then a reply, and there would be a discussion. And then that was printed out. And that is the book. Um, and I, as unbiased as I'm not, I think it works. <laughs> I, th I think the, the questioning from these ex very ex intelligent, capable people on my left, who come, by the way, from quite different generations. One, just one generation down. Then the others, I think they were in kindergarten when I was <laughs> around. Uh, but very, very capable indeed. So I wanted the book to be about ideas. Um, ideas that were taking place not just abstractly in, in the philosophy course, but in the in engagement with political situations. And that's, that's what we did. Um, the other thing I wanted the book to do, if we did a book, was to show two things. One, the history of social democracy from the, my period on, from my 1968 on, um, and to demonstrate that in some vivid way, hopefully. And then the other uh, objective was to show that the ideas of social democracy are relevant today, not just something of the past, but of today. And I think the, the book does that, but I leave it up to you I hope you all buy a copy of the book, of course, but if you, when you read it, uh, to make, make the judgment whether, whether it shows the relevance or not. And the, the distinguishing feature uh, that I would like to stress of social democracy that Olivia spoke about, the, 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 there, there are two important aspects. Uh, and they came out in the great period for ordinary people in the Western world, certainly, between 1945 and 1975. This was the hot heyday in some way of social democracy. But what, what distinguished the movement then and does today is a preoccupation with inequality. No other political movement in, in the world focuses on inequality the way social democrats do. And that's a non, it's an ongoing challenge with a capitalist economy that generates, by definition, inequality. So the big battle, politically, civilly, hopefully in democratic countries, of, of ironing out the great inequalities to make a more equal society. The second aspect of that uh, that occurred during that period as well is to use terrible jargon, decommodification. That is to say, to take things out of the market and provide them as rights of citizenship. The emergence of social and economic rights in that period in the Western world, I believe, were the great source of freedom for ordinary people. When we made pensions a right, when we did that with Medicare, when we started to do it in the early 1980s with housing, this lifted a burden from ordinary people and gave them, on the other side of that, the freedom of not having to worry about that and to do other things with their lives. So the two great uh, 
ingredients of social democracy for me are the preoccupation with inequality on the one hand and decommodification or taking certain things out of the, out of the market and making them rights of citizenship. So this, these were the, the, uh, the markings of the development in the 1970s and 80s. And, that, and then along, or right from the 1945 rather, and then along came the great period, infamous period for me, of neoliberalism led by Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, picked up here by governments in Canada as well, we started to get preoccupied with low taxes, as if that was a virtue in itself. That is to say, cutbacks and programming that taking place with cutbacks and taxes. And that persisted all over the Western world uh, since 1980 as a, as a movement. And it, it has continued up to today. And so the, re the relevance of social democracy, I believe, could not be greater. Take the case right before us now, too, one playing out federally, the other right here that Olivia talked about, the case of pharmacare on the one hand and housing on the other. These are two major social initiatives that are desired by Canadians and every survey would show that. And a, a government with a sense of social responsibility would get on to them and bring in universal pharmacare on the one hand and a mix of housing programs on the other to ensure that no one in Canada has to live in a circumstance where he or she is inadequately housed. So I, I conclude my opening comments with that observation, and I turn it over to my friends on the left. Um, <laughs> give, give, them, give them a warm welcome, and beginning with Luke Savage. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so what's going to happen now, um, can you all hear me okay? So what's going to happen now is uh, the three of us are each going to deliver brief remarks about uh, concern with different facets of the book, kind of in roughly chronological order uh, as how they appear in the book. Uh, and I'm going to begin by talking about a subject that was among my favorite uh, to speak about and think about uh, over the course of this book, um, and that's the subject of uh, industrial democracy, which was something that uh, interested a young MPP from uh, or MP from Oshawa uh, greatly in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So uh, when we hear the phrase social democracy today, uh, we tend to see it as synonymous with the likes of universal public services stronger social safety nets, and the redistribution of wealth. Uh, in short, we see it as being first and foremost about equality. Uh, but the best traditions of the left have, I think, always been animated by another uh, important and I think an unavoidably related concern, uh, and that being a deep idea of democracy. Uh, in, the 21st, in 21st century liberal democracies such as ours, uh, the concept of democracy, the, the way it's broadly conceived, is generally limited, um, as Ed uh, has said already, to the sphere of uh, civil and political rights. And here I'd like to quote from a 1969 speech of Ed's, quote, for liberals and conservatives, society is democratic if three principal requirements are met. One, all adults have the right to vote. Two, there are periodic elections in which those who want to may compete for political office. And three, there is the right to criticize the government. But, Ed continued, for socialists, this view of democracy is inadequate, and it is inadequate because it is incomplete. 
We agree that any democratic society must have these characteristics. However, we also believe that any society having only these qualities is not fully democratic. Now, why was that? Well, today, as when Ed first spoke those words more than 50 years ago, those in the working majority spend a less than negligible portion of their waking lives operating at the whims of management and with corporate power often exerting itself more strongly on their daily lives than that of the state. For this reason, the democratic socialist or social democrat asserts that more than civil and political rights are necessary for the realization of a truly free and democratic society in which all of us can flourish. For that, something further is needed. To quote again from Ed's speech, quote, a fully democratic society for us is one in which the opportunity for self-realization is equally available to all. And self-realization means the free development of our moral, intellectual, aesthetic, and sensual capabilities. It does not mean, as it does for liberals and conservatives who talk about equal opportunity, the ability to get ahead of and control others. Furthermore, a socialist believes that in a fully developed democracy, the average citizen should possess direct or, incorrect, or indirect control over all of those decisions which have a serious effect on their day-to-day -day lives. I thought there was water under here. I'm glad I was right. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, it was that second point uh, that drew Ed during his early years uh, as an MP towards the vital, but I think now uh, largely forgotten, concept of industrial democracy. Um, because even in the most egalitarian of workplaces, even in the union shops, uh, like the auto plants where many of Ed's UAW constituents in Ottawa spent their working hours, workers themselves did not and do not have any guaranteed say in what happens around them. Despite their labor producing value for their employees, workers do not have the right to decide how a company's resources should be spent. They do not uh, determine the price of its products or services, the nature of those products and services, when new technological innovations or practices should be introduced, etc. Because of the way our economic and political system has developed, each of those things and much more remain uh, the prerogatives of management. And when Ed first arrived in Ottawa after uh, the 1968 federal election, uh, advocating for this richer and fuller idea of democracy, that is for social, uh, but also for economic and industrial democracy, that was something he took up from his very first day as an MP. I want to quote again from another of Ed's speeches, this one, his very first address to the House of Commons, delivered on September the 20th, 1968. Quote, we must begin by insisting that in a democratic society, all adults should have equal rights in all those institutions which directly affect them. Where authority is delegated, then those to whom it is delegated must be responsible to those over whom they exercise their authority. This means that in our factories, in our offices, in our large commercial and financial institutions, legal power must shift from the few at the top to the many below. Management can and must be made responsible to workers, just as we, MPs that is, are responsible to our constituents. Now, we have limited time this afternoon, so I won't go uh, further into uh, detail about what that meant in policy terms. You'll find plenty more on that in the book. Uh, but as I said uh, off the top of my remarks, uh, of all the things that have inspired and uh, animated me throughout this project, it is this insight, I think, and the rich vision of democracy, human freedom, and rights that comes with it that best distills the, ed, uh, the essence of Ed's politics. People are not truly free if they lack the right to participate in the decisions and institutions that affect their daily lives, including those of the economy and the workplace. Society, by the same token, is not fully democratic uh, until all of us can become economic as well as political citizens. In an unequal society such as ours, and in an unequal world where capital is now not only national but global in scope, this more expansive view of democracy is, I think, uh, arguably uh, every bit as urgent, if not more urgent, than it was in 1968. Uh, so thank you very much. With that, I'll now yield the floor to my colleague, Francis Abel. Thank you. Thank 
you all for being here. Um, I wanted to work on this book first because the ideas were intensely interesting, but more importantly, uh, because I think our country has come, has come to the moment when we need to have a good conversation about the future and about the problems that we have that builds on the strengths, that builds on the good things that have happened, the achievements of the last 50 years. There are lots of those, and we're in difficult circumstances for sure, uh, but we don't start from a bad place. These achievements, social, economic, and political achievements, are the achievements largely of social democracy. This is what Ed's life has been about, and that's what the book is about. So my job tonight is to draw your attention to some of the ideas in the book um, in two chapters. We called one of them the rights revolution and the other one the great patriation debate. Ed makes an observation in the rights revolution chapter that is the beginning, I think, of sorting our way through the current controversies of apparently non-class related sources of discrimination and inequality. Um, when people struggle for th racial equality and gender equality and all the other equalities we know about, this, the right often invokes the term woke and criticizes people for making that, uh, for, for the, what they're fighting for and use the term as invective. Um, it's wrong. Ed noticed that the wave of effective rights movements, linguistic rights, the women's movement, anti-racism, indigenous rights, trans and two-spirit LGBTQ movements, all of those had something in common, although of course each has um, a unique source, a, a different a dynamic and a unique momentum. What they have in common is that all of those movements began in the context of the relative economic security for most of the population that was provided during the 30 years expansion of the social welfare state during approximately 1945 to 1975. Consolidation of basic economic security opened the space for expanded and multifaceted demands for social and economic equity and for indigenous people self-determination. It seems to me that Ed's insight about the connection between the achievements of the working class and, and then um, the achievements of other right-seeking groups, that insight helps explain why the debate about wokeness has had less traction here in Canada compared to the United States. Bluntly, we have more social democracy. It suggests that the rights movements can be seen as a continuation of the logic of workers' action that produced the modern welfare state. Uh, I want to read a very short passage from the book uh, to give an idea of what I mean. Ed writes, social democracy has extended its analysis of inequality into the domain of broader cultural and group rights, including indigenous rights, linguistic rights, and others that find their origin in the fulfillment of particular groups. Put another way, social democrats ultimately view group rights as necessary antecedents of many civil rights that are essential for individual freedom. People can only realize their political and civil rights within a social context, which ultimately implies the need for recognition of particular groups and the context-specific struggles they face or have faced, so that there is an intimate connection between economic justice and justice for, all the other so for people who suffer from all the other sources of discrimination. So that's the first point I wanted to make. There's only one more. Um, a second fruitful discussion in the book of contemporary relevance appears in the discussion of the patriation of the Constitution and the forging of the content of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Key parts of the Charter were directly negotiated by Ed with the Prime Minister, with then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. In particular, Section 92 of the Constitution Act, which deals with provincial control of natural resources. You'll be glad I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, and Section 35, which affirms existing Aboriginal treaty rights, Aboriginal and treaty rights of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples. 
Section 35 is there because of a massive, sustained mobilization of indigenous people over many years. But it's also there because one political party, the NDP, was convinced of the justice of indigenous demands and chose to support them. The story of how Ed overcame the objections of Prime Minister Trudeau, his principled reluctance uh, to accept indigenous rights, is in the book. And I think you should ask Ed about it in the, in the question period. But we learned something from this story. Section 35 was not loved by anyone in 1982. At Patriation, it was supposed to be elaborated in a series of First Minister's Conference after Patriation, and these failed. But Indigenous people didn't fail. In a long series of court cases, they gradually forced the Canadian legal system to give force and meaning to the phrase existing Aboriginal and treaty rights that culminated in decisions that recognized Indigenous jurisdiction over their land. The existence of Section 35 made those victories possible. And Ed's work in, as leader of the New Democratic Party then made Section 35 possible. It stands as an example of the stepwise progress in our history, as rights build upon rights, as these are institutionalized and become part of the taken for granted fabric of the country, as the Charter is now. Ed's book concludes by speaking of social democracy as an aspiring condition, always aspiring to correct the injustices of the outcomes of the market. These are two illustrations of how that works. Now, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to my colleague, Jonathan Sess. Good afternoon, everybody. Just have to drink this in a bit. It is such an honor to get to share, at long last, this book with everybody, a remarkable book. And it's particularly sweet to do it with the support of family and friends. The book itself has a fascinating origin story, and it's captured by my colleague Luke in the introduction. One of the important inspirations was an email I received in 2015 from Ed's late wife, Ellen Makesons Wood. I was working at the Institute, and Ellen and I had developed a cordial relationship, always scheming on the left vanguard of the Institute. <laughs> One day she wrote to me in earnest, encouraging that Ed's legacy, his contributions to public life, be documented and given their due. And it is that task to capture Ed's contributions in the realm of both ideas and action that has given the four of us such nourishment through these past years. And it's a task by which I hope the book will be measured. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that for years between that email and reaching out to Ed one fateful December night in 2020, uh, councilor, city councilor Alejandra Bravo who I call the people's champ, never stopped reminded me, reminding me of the necessity of that task. And it was her constant encouragement that uh, prompted my email to Ed. I know readers will be engrossed by the book's engagement with Ed across key moments in Canadian politics and will be inspired by the broad horizons of his democratic socialist vision for this country, which he earnestly put to voters in four elections, I believe. I know you will appreciate understanding what drove his unwavering pursuit of equality, one grounded in deep respect for ordinary people. But what, one of the most exciting elements of this book is its exploration of a much lesser known dimension of Ed and his career, which is his internationalism, his insistence on the promotion and realization of human rights against the grain of, quote, the cold and uncaring logic of markets. 
In chapter six, titled Social Democracy Without Borders, readers get a window into his nearly two decades of activity in the once proud Socialist International. There, Ed became a close friend and trusted colleague of former German Chancellor Willy Brandt. Brandt, among other world leaders, shaped Ed's politics and reinforced his conviction that the goal of any social democratic party ought to be to form government, to wield power and not settle for being the conscience of parliament. At the Socialist International, Ed was engaged in important diplomatic efforts, as uh, Mayor Chow told us about, in Central America, advancing human rights and advocating for social movements against an imposing current of repressive US foreign policy, often propping up violent military regimes. As he recounts in detail in the book, he even became an interlocutor with Cuba's revolutionary leader, Fidel Castro. Ed's speech to the Socialist International Congress, which was held in Vancouver in 1978, is reprinted in full in the appendices of the book. And there are a number of gems in the appendices. In it, he makes an impassioned case for countering the outstretched power of the modern multinational corporation. Just as we want to redistribute wealth within Canada, he said then, we also want to do the same on a world basis. We want to respond to the moral obligation to combat famine, malnutrition, and the poverty and hopelessness which makes wretched the conditions of so many millions. Ed would go on to carry his deep concern with the inequality produced by unfettered markets throughout his career. In chapter nine, titled Globalization and the Struggle for Equality, he explores his time at the helm of rights and democracy. His appointment uh, leading rights and democracy was made by then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. And this, of course, was at a moment where a very different Tory tradition was still alive in Canada. At Rights and Democracy, Ed's deep commitment to social and economic rights and to the international covenants meant to enforce them would butt up against the tidal forces of global free trade and corporate power. Whether advocating for trade unionists in China, garment workers in South Asia, or for indigenous rights, within Canada, rights and democracy rejected the narrow neoliberal framework of democracy promotion of the time. I want to leave you with one longer passage from the book. It's one I think exemplifies Ed's internationalism. It was published, or a shorter version was, in the Globe and Mail in 1986. Uh, actually, Ed has op-eds in the Globe and Mail from every decade uh, since he was in Parliament, and just reading through those is uh, a testament to him as a public intellectual. But he wrote this just as he was becoming the most popular leader, according to polls at the time, in the country. And it was a time when many leaders of social democratic parties in the Global North were retreating from their convictions, not Ed. Quote, the world of a politician is a world of light and shadow, never merely pragmatic, it is always moral. I get goosebumps that this was in the Globe. <laughs> Anyways, for us in the international social democratic movement, there has always been the difficulty of reconciling certain universal universal principles with their application in a variety of countries with widely divergent histories. It is a problem, it is difficult, but it must be done. We apply the principles of equality, liberty, and economic justice constantly within our own nations, of course. This is a difficulty we take for granted. But just as we must make critical judgments at home, so too must we when we look at other countries. Cultural and historical differences must certainly be taken into account, but they never absolve us of the obligation to judge, decide, and act. When we talk about democracy, pluralism, religious freedom, tolerance, human rights and self-determination, 
we are not giving voice to mere abstractions relevant only to a few nations. We're talking about human values and ideals we believe desirable for all people at all times in all parts of the world. Thank you. So, how are people feeling? Right? I'm, I'm energized and we haven't even gotten to the best part, the Q&A. Uh, so this is how uh, the Q&A uh, will work. We have former Broadbent Institute staff member and current mentor of the Broadbent Institute <laughs> staff and, um, and supporters, Erica Capito, has uh, the microphone. It's true. Yeah, I'm go I will honor you. I will honor you and who you are. Uh, and so if you have a question, just please put up your hand uh, and Erica will bring uh, the microphone over. We can get through many questions if everyone introduces themselves quickly and succinctly. And I'll repeat the question for the panel. Mic on, please. Okay, it's on. Uh, three thoughts to begin with. One billion dollars is one thousand million dollars. The planet has 2,640 billionaires. And the richest 1% own almost half of the world's wealth. So my question is, that seems to kill social democracy. And my question is, is should we, can we, limit how much money a person has? Could it be limited to, let's say, $500 million? <laughs> because the rest seems totally nuts to me and kills our social democracy. Your thoughts? I guess we're, we're Mike up so we would talk. Yeah, well, that's, uh, in one sense, I, I was talking about that, and so all my panelists. The, the key thing, whether you one agrees or not, is when you have a market-based economy, as we have, then the challenge for democracy always is to work against the inequality that that market produces. And uh, although the figures you give today look very alarming, and, and indeed they are in terms of equity, uh, in a similar, if not the same quantity, distances between rich and poor in the 20s and 30s and 40s existed. There were, there were great uh, disparities in wealth. And, and in the, the, along came the welfare state after the war and narrowed that out considerably. And, but it was, I want to emphasize it was politically driven economic circumstances certainly favored, but it was the ideological movement of Willy Brandt in Germany, uh, Attlee in, in, in the UK, Jupton Oil, a wonderful Dutchman in the Netherlands. I could name people that I got to know later on in the 70s. Well, they built the welfare state and they addressed inequality and narrowed the gap. And there's no reason for us, that we, we can't do the same. It's a, it's a political reality, and if the liberals were genuine and progressive, they would be moving in the tax-based policy of the kind you're talking about. It's long overdue in Canada, and we need it. Oh, just uh, very briefly, I don't have a question, but Ed, as a Chilean, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your human rights advocacy and for the pressure put on the pet government to open their eyes to what was going on in Chile in 1973 and afterwards and open up a quota of immigrants or refugees 
to come to this country and be saved from the brutality of Pinochet. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, hi there. Uh, my question is with NDP governments in Manitoba and BC, will there be projects where, um, you know, there's coordination to develop this kind of syllabus in high school? Uh, because uh, uh, unfortunately, mainstream economics is completely divorced from reality. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there should be. <laughs> there should be. And given that I had a recent and brief conversation with the Premier of British Columbia, who came and spoke in Ottawa recently, and I know Bob Canoe reasonably well, and his his victory in Manitoba. Excuse me. <laughs> anyway, I I get emotionally engaged, and it's just remarkable what this means. For indigenous people in Manitoba. Yeah. And to not avoid the question, but to be brief on it, at uh, federal provincial meetings, I'm sure the two premiers, uh, one from BC, one from Manitoba, will collaborate on things. I have no doubt about that. Um, hello, this has been a, been a wonderful panel. Um, uh, we hear a lot about the angry and the disaffected, uh, the people who feel rightly or wrongly that they're somehow left out from the considerations of government. And this seems to be where we get a lot of poly ever supporters and down south the Trump voters and so on. Do any of you have thoughts about why these people that we think should embrace social democracy have gone right instead of left? Huh? No, I think that you know one of the best illustrations of the need for a social democratic movement. To be to to be brief, in the U.S., it started actually with the, the Clinton Democrats. What started was the abandonment of, of working class U.S. The industrial workers uh, throughout the U.S. used to uh, vote in droves for, for the Democratic Party when the Democratic Party addressed their needs. And it's pr principally, of course, with Franklin Roosevelt. But then it carried right on up until the uh, Clinton administration and then uh, like so many pot the same politics happened in the UK too. The, the leaders, I regret to say, of uh, progressive parties, once progressive parties, gave up on working for uh, ordinary workers and started to go after the new university educated elites. And so they, the Democrats went after successfully uh, in, in the Cambridge area of, of the US on the one coast and uh, the, in California on the other. Uh, so they, they, they abandoned workers, brought in trade deals that were extraordinarily harmful for industrial workers, including my hometown in Oshawa. Uh, when I was elected in Oshawa, we had 20,000 auto workers. In the last count, there were 2,000, all right? So the, these trade deals that our governments and, even, and uh, beginning with Clinton negotiated just left a big vacuum for thousands of workers. And along comes Trump. And, and he, he rightly criticized these deals and, and was forthright in his condemnation, totally misleading in his promise to workers. But because the workers had not been given the kind of leadership by, by the Democratic Party they once were, they went to Trump. And a similar thing happened, I can say, in Northern England, where the families there for generations had voted for labor. Uh, but in the, in the last decade or so, uh, labor uh, disproportionately favored 
programs of this new educated elite, and we're more interested in the, in the sort of razzmatazz people of London, um, to get them on side politically, and they ignored what was going on in those devastated communities in Northern England, and so that the, they went overwhelmingly in recent elections to the Tories. Now, this, this has gone on in many countries, this, the, the failure of some social democratic parties to stick with their base, and at the same time, a number of them have actually brought in the trade policies that did harm. So there's now, now a strong movement, I think, uh, Mr. Biden, for example, on the whole, has been a remarkable president, the only president in U.S. history to, to campaign openly on a picket line. Uh, Biden has done that. So there's some, there's some genuine efforts to reconnect in the, Amer in the American context with workers. And we certainly hope they are more successful in doing this in the coming campaign against Trump than they, than they were not long ago. Uh, thank you, Mr. Broadbent. It's uh, great to be here. Um, my question is, I guess, similar to what my uh, colleague asked um, in regards to anger and politics. I'm a mixed race. I come from a Filipino background, and I am seeing the conservatives absolutely build upon, to me, the justified anger with the liberal alternative that Luke writes so great about. Uh, and she's picking up relatives of mine who've never voted before, who've never wanted to vote. Um, again, Filipino immigrants who start, to be frank, speaking in xenophobic ways and point, you know, pointing to the issues of Trudeau's immigrants' targets and all of that. So how do we pick up on this anger and more importantly bring in new voters? Because I'm having many friends who are apolitical left either move to the right or check out completely. And it does seem to be, especially with my generation, I'm in my late 20s, just a lack of hope and feeling that our generation is lost and what's the point of working if you can't afford a house or afford rent? Well, I'm tempted to say, would you mind asking another question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I, if I had an adequate answer to that, I would probably be here as a prime minister or ex-prime minister. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be facetious. I think it is, it is very complex determining why people vote the way they do. I gave some indications in my last answer about what motivated, for example, Trump voters and why they came away in the U.S. from the Democrats. It, the situation is more complicated in Canada. We, we haven't, as Francis has said, we, we have a more social democratic tradition that's embedded in our political institutions than to the, the, the country to the south of us. But why, for example, the, your Filipino uh, friends Filipino Canadians, obviously, um, are going conservative. I don't know fully. I think, for example, uh, Jagmeet Singh is doing the right thing, as far as I can see, promoting pharmacare very vigorously now, working on a, a housing initiative to deal with uh, uh, an immense problem of housing. Uh, I don't think he can do more than that. He has, he has to be doing that. Um, and then hope for the best. I mean, that's one, one of the, the real stories of political life is that it's constantly uphill. It is constantly uphill, and with moment, I would say momentary moments of joy, like when the Manitoba government was elected, and, and when we see some things they do, but then we'll see, we'll see with the Manitoba government, some hard decisions they have to make. And they won't always be popular either. But, uh, so all I, can, I, all I can say is that the, the best approach, I think, is A, to be seen to be listening, and to show them, show them respect. Don't, don't be dismissive because, say, your Filipino friends are, are voting uh, for right-wing parties. 
show them respect, produce a, a social and economic pro program that is aimed at dealing with the problems they're facing, and then campaign very hard and hope for the best. Um, hello, Mr. Broadbent. My name is Luca. I am a member of the New Democrats on, at U of T. Um, and I just had a question regarding some of the uh, discussions that was had earlier about your work at the Socialist International. When I was in high school, I did a simulation of the Socialist International at my school. So I felt so I certainly believe that um, building institutions at an international level to uh, accommodate social democratic movement is very, very important. I remember in researching that uh, for that committee, um, I read a an article in Jacobin, and the v the beginning is quite incendiary, if I might read it. Um, it says, "No left organization in the world combines venerable history uh, with total irrelevance than the Socialist International." Uh, do you What's agree? <laughs> What's it mean? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Luke. Luke couldn't do that. <laughs> uh, do you agree with this view, and where do you think the future of institutional um, and international level uh, social democratic movement looks like? Well, the failure of the Socialist International for me is a classic example of the importance of personalities. The Socialist International was a viable, creative, admired organization when Willy Brandt was the head of it. When Willy Brandt uh, went to Japan, he would be talking to the Prime Minister of Japan right away and, and wherever he went in the world and trying to work for uh, peace, for example. And he built up enthusiasm. I, I, was, I became a Vice President of Socialist International and we had uh, Olaf Palma from Sweden there. We had Jupiter Noel I mentioned earlier from the Netherlands and Shimon Perez from Israel and, and uh, representative leaders from many parts of the world, but they, they participated because Brandt demonstrated in his own being uh, a, a, a magnificent legacy. He, as many of you will know, he, as a young boy, he fled the Nazis for the Scandinavian countries. And then they, he, he left there and became mayor of Berlin, and from mayor of Berlin, eventually chancellor. But, and after Brandt died, the Socialist International virtually withered away. Uh, I won't name any names, but his successors totally lacked the imaginative skill and driving force that that job required. And so the impact of the Socialist International just withered away. And it was sad in history because it was building up in Brandt to be an alternative you know, to the old Soviet Union and to more conservative right-wing politics of the U.S. He was, he was starting to get traction in other countries around for collective action by social democratic parties. But when, it, when he left, uh, the leadership that came after him just wasn't up to the task, frankly. Mr. Broadbent, uh, congratulations on your life's work and the pleasure to see you today. I have a question for you based on your work with particularly Pierre Trudeau on the Constitution. What can we learn from those experiences, particularly in light of the Manitoba's election? I think one of the things that happened on that first day of the election is former Liberal Cap Minister Lloyd Axworthy endorsing the NDP on that opening day. And uh, what, what do you think the learning is from that and how can there be more collaboration in the progressive parties? Well, well as, as the whole country knows, there is collaboration right now uh, between the, the Liberals and New Democrats. I, I wouldn't claim to say they should do anything more than they're doing. But you mentioned a sort of collaboration with Pierre Trudeau when I, when I was leader of the party. That, that was a terrific chapter in Canadian history for me and for Canadians to know some of the details that Francis alluded the coming to the Constitution of Section 35, which is a recognition of existing Aboriginal and treaty rights, was a, a marvelous story in itself. And sure, if I may say so, it showed the le political leadership of Pierre Trudeau. 
because he did not believe, I repeat, he did not believe in indigenous rights as such. And it was in, an intellectual process for him. He thought, if you're going to have equality, all people have to have the same rights. So there should not be a group of Canadians, indigenous rights, uh, indigenous people with their own rights. Uh, and uh, some of us categorically reject that view, um, just as we want fra francophone rights in certain parts of Canada where they're a minority, protected, uh, Anglo rights protected elsewhere. So, so too, uh, indigenous rights uh, had, had to be for some, some of us embedded in the Constitution, and we made it clear, as did a couple of premiers who decided with us, we made it clear that we would not support the initiative for the new Constitution if they weren't included. And to Trudeau's credit as a politician, he understood that he wasn't going to get the whole, whole package of a Charter of Rights, which is otherwise superb, uh, if, he, if he didn't yield on indigenous rights, and so he accepted. He accepted it politically as a necessity in, in Canada at that time, and that was that showed some political leadership. And so, in terms of Mr. the Pax Do you think that was instrumental in the eventual election? No, I, I think I, I don't think it was instrumental in his winning. I don't. I'm, I'm not on the scene of the campaign, so I'm not sure. But it, it's typical of Lloyd Axworthy. He takes. He's always taken progressive positions. Uh, uh, even 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 when when he was in the cabinet, it was a little less progressive. So it didn't didn't uh, didn't surprise me that he did that. Last question. Okay, um, this question is about housing, and how we move forward. Given that that uh, rents are in many cities now two and three times what a person with a median income or a senior on a fixed income can afford, is it time for us to consider rolling back rents? Because even if we implement very strict rent control tomorrow, uh, it would take decades for wages to catch up, even with hefty increases in wages. Another, another question I just as soon not try to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I will try, I will try. In, in, again, if you look at what happened with the, with the Liberals in the early 1980s, they, that set the example of what could be done. We, we had in Ron Basford, who was a Liberal minister from the West Coast, was Minister of Housing. I happened to be the housing critic for the NDP at that time, not the leader. And we worked on a whole smorgasbord of housing programs, co-op housing, uh, social housing of variety types, low interest fixed mortgages for people. So we had a, an imaginative uh, housing program that appealed not just to the poor, which is fundamental, but to average Canadians as well. So it had political support, and not only had to have political support in Canada, Europeans, of all people then, Europeans were coming to Canada to learn about housing policy because we had such a magnificent government-driven, broad-ranging initiative. And I, I don't have the figures in my pocket and I won't make them up, but the, I did look at the figures of housing starts back in 1980 and compared it to recently. And there's, there's no comparison that the earlier phase in housing in Canada was much greater uh, even when population differences are taken into account. So we need, we need some, someone in, in the cabinet to take on housing and really drive it, I think to, to, to see it as the national crisis, which it is, uh, facing all provinces and all, all cities and, and at least show signs of beginning now to address it. 
And there are other income-related programs that I don't know in detail that could be related to help pay in the short run uh, low-income Canadians. But it's a good example of where housing as a social right should be implemented. And uh, a government, and by the way, th this government did establish what, two years ago, I think three years, housing as a social right. I should have pointed out to them that the, it already was established in Canada in 1976 as a social right. Also by the liberals, they seem to forget for a, a decade or so, and then they rediscovered it and brought it back. Well, they should act on it. Well, oh, should I test the room? Do we want one more question? Okay, one more, one more question. Very bluntly, is civil discourse in politics dead? I see this great picture of you, uh, Joel Clark and uh, Pierre Trudeau, but uh, we've seen in recent years where the Prime Minister gets gravel thrown at them. Jagmeet Singh is uh, shouted down at a, uh, um, when he's supporting the NDP candidate in Peterborough. And I, don't see, I didn't see that kind of politics back when you were um, yeah, the leader, but uh, we've gone down a really bad rabbit hole. I'm just wondering, um, A, do you think a civil, or a civil society or a civil discourse is like gone? And how do we restore that uh, back so that we are exchanging the ideas that we've been talking about today? Well, uh, frankly, if you look at Canadian history, civil discourse has gone up and down. Uh, I, you'd be embarrassed, I think, to read the debates in the 19th century and, uh, and how politicians talked about each other then. Uh, they were anything but polite. So, um, and in my period from 1968 on, uh, I would say that the degree of civility went up and down uh, it, it, for reasons I can't hope to explain. Uh, some periods seem to be more civil than others. It, it, it takes leaders to make that happen, of course. You know, one of the guys that's been most undervalued in Canadian history, I think, is Bob Stanfield, who was leader of the Conservative Party. And his, his uh, great fault was he dropped a football one time. <laughs> and that became the national story in an election campaign, and out he went. But Stanfield was the, the, the kind of man where civility mattered. Um, and all I, all I can say is that this, this requires uh, political leadership, um, and particularly political leadership when it's under stress, which it is right now. Uh, for all, all the leaders to be civil. And there is one leader, and it's not the leader of the bloc or the leader of the NDP or the leader of the Liberal Party, <laughs> who, who needs to be more civil. Uh, okay. uh, uh. Well, I guess I have to face the fact that we're at we're at the end. We're at the end of the Q&A session. So um, I just want to, um, I just want to thank the authors. Um, thank you so much for joining with us today. Um, our publisher, ECW Press. Um, and uh, I would also like to thank um, Mayor Chow. Also with us is uh, Deputy Mayor Osma Malik. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and we, I guess, give a wave. Yeah, it's good. Uh, we also have joining us um, the MPP for Oshawa, Jennifer French. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, and of course, um, the uh, Toronto Public Library for hosting us and for everyone for making the journey on a, on a Sunday. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, so I would, I would just like to say just a little bit more about the Institute as the authors take, take a bit of a breath uh, before we begin uh, some book signing. Twelve years ago, 
when we were founded was the height of uh, conservative power, or so it seemed. There was a Harper majority. Sun News North was, was launched, or, or Sun News was launched as a Fox News North. It's now Rebel Media. Um, the Manning Center was just beginning to have their networking events. It's now Candace Strong and Free. Um, and of course, there's so many um, outlets that are uh, from, from a right vantage point turning up public policy and polling. And we were purpose built to try and uh, fill these gaps in the progressive ecosystem on training, on policy, and on media. In this past year alone, we have, uh, we have authored uh, public policy position papers on housing, on mental health, on grocery profits. Uh, we have launched a brand new online journal of political economy and social democracy called Perspectives. So perspectivesjournal.ca. Um, and there we are going to be publishing opinion pieces, book reviews, and, uh, and, uh, and, and summations of, of really important peer reviewed research or research that our, our allies are conducting. And yes, these links can be shared online because it's a journal at a think tank. Um, and we also uh, continue to, uh, to fund our independent media outlet, Press Progress, which is read by millions of Canadians each and every year. One out of 18 Canadians has clicked on, a, on that link and viewed it from our website. And that, doesn't, that also doesn't account for the millions who read our stories that are picked up by major media outlets. In fact, I tracked last year over 200 times our stories in Press Progress were picked up by other media outlets. Um, our summit, that's a place for all of us to come together and network. And we have such a big tent, everything from center liberals to proud democratic socialists, everyone in between, and we can come together and we can think about what are the big issues of the day and how do we bring in experts, people on the ground to come together and tell us about these specific issues before it lands in our lab. And so last year we talked about housing, we talked about immigration, we talked about tech um, and, and energy. And now today we're seeing some of those dis early discussions that we had realized as it's, as it's all kind of coming to a crunch. So there was a flyer, I, please join us at the summit. Um, and then lastly, I wanna to speak to something on a new initiative th this past year that's really near and dear to our heart is um, our training and our leadership. So we launched a brand new cohort uh, called the Emerging Leaders um, Project. And we had found 20 young leaders from across Canada, um, of which 90% of these young leaders were black, indigenous, or racialized people, people who have who are early career and who are looking to move into uh, other positions in whether it is uh, in a corporate sphere, in unions, um, uh, in nonprofits, uh, or in government. And uh, people came together and, um, and learned at the summit in the months in between, were paired with a mentor, uh, and they're going to be attending our gala and doing another couple days here in Toronto. Um, and this project wouldn't, all of these projects, whether it's popular policy, media, training, um, our summit, they would not be possible without your support. Um, and of course, the razzmatazz people, that's a new one, Ed, I love it. The razzmatazz people, the, the millionaires, they're certainly not lining up to support working people coming together and, and advancing these issues. So please um, consider donating to our work monthly. There's no other pitch than that. Hopefully you read our emails, you can visit our tent, uh, our, um, our table, uh, if you'd like to begin contributing. And if 200 people do it, then that will make up a $50,000 gap that we do have for training next year. And we wanna, we wanna do that again. I can't tell you um, all of the personal stories of these 20 people and how this has changed their lives. So thank you for coming to the program. Thank you for your continued support of, of our small but mighty institute. Thank you, Ed Broadbent, for, as someone said, your life's work. <laughs> um, and, um, wow, I'm getting teary. Um, <laughs> so um, if you can give us a moment, uh, and the authors can make their way to the signing table in the back. If you would like to purchase a book, it's still possible at the table up here. 
and just um, create a line. Oh yeah, our, our kiddos. Uh, if you can create a line, um, our authors will be ready at the table to begin signing the books. Uh, so thank you once again so much for making the time to come out today.